Oh, is this fun or what? So, during the pictures, I hope you all realize that was the actual costume, the armor, the actual armor, that I wore on the show for six years. And the last time I wore it was 27 years ago. And it still fit. So, this is gonna be so much fun. I heard so many interesting stories during the pictures. Um, people telling me that they've watched Joseph all their lives. Started when they were five. Before they were born, I was doing this. And it made me realize, this is more than just a show. This, this really is our lives. And this is one of the things I want to do during this sing-along. Yes, we're going to sing, and you guys, I want to hear some singing. Do you know the words? Yeah! Yeah, that was a stupid question. But well, we have the words at the bottom of the screen. You probably saw it at the opening. So I want you to, to read those. But this is the way I want to start this. Yes, we're going to have a lot of fun. Yes, you know the story, the backstory of this. But you don't know the preparation that it took to get to this point. So I'm going to give you a perspective uh, that you probably don't have of the preparation that I went through to become Joseph. Sometimes people think, well, you know, you get a script and say, yeah, let's do it. Let's go you know, show it. You learn the songs, you learn the dances. And, and that's pretty much what everybody does. I do it a little differently. I do the research. I find out a lot about the person. And the, the, the research, you guys, I mean, it was just like, you can't believe what I went through to learn the life of Joseph. But here, I want to follow this so I can get everything right. Here's an insight of the beginnings of Joseph for me. I had heard the story, obviously, from the Bible growing up, but it was Marie. It was Marie that really introduced me to Joseph. Back long before Andrew Lloyd Webber and Tim Rice wrote this thing, they wrote it in 79 which, by the way, debuted in Scotland. And I'm going to be there in December. Can you believe I'm going back to Joseph? It's like rubbish. Okay. Okay, I'm going to digress here for a second. Can you imagine, you guys? Now, you know, Pharaoh is clear upon the steps, and this big face comes up. I don't know what the set is, is going to be when I go uh, to Scotland. But rest assured, it's going to be pretty dramatic, right? I am going to be Pharaoh, and I'm going to walk down. <laughs> and when I see Joseph for the first time, <laughs> can you imagine the lines that I could say? <laughs> like, for instance, uh, hello, Joe. I'm going for I feel your pain. <laughs> Whatever it might be, you know, but whatever, because I want to come out of character. I want to break that fourth wall. And I'm hoping the director, I'm hoping, I'm hoping Andrew, like Weber, will let me break that fourth wall because that's going to be part of the fun of it, you know, just saying, I know what you feel like, buddy, but I'm not wearing that anymore. <laughs> Stuff like that. Anyway, back to the script. It was Marie's version of Dolly Parton's song. Code of Many Colors that introduced me to the fact that, oh, there's music to this story of Joseph. And it wasn't just a song that she, she recorded. This Because you probably haven't heard Marie's version. The reason why you haven't heard her version, it was a demo that she sent to this guy in charge of the Nashville MGM Records division. He heard that Code of Many Colors and that's why Marie got a contract, and that's when she recorded the Paper Roses. Oh. So it was Joseph. It was the story of Joseph that gave Marie her recording career. Shortly after that, I think it was around the mid-80s, 
my brother Jimmy, who we all love and adore. He was playing a role of Joseph in this play with the longest name in history, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, and it didn't spell color correctly. Sorry for the Brits. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, you had you had a language first, so they, they got it right. So anyway, I went over to the Poconos, uh, northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, really? You know where the Poconos are? There's a little theater there that he was playing this in, and it was just, the, the audience was probably 50 people. That's, it was just such a small little theater. And I went there to support it. And it was the cutest show in the world, okay? Now, I'm, I hope I don't bore you with this because it's important that I set the stage in this. Thus, this is my memory of the musical Joseph. It's Marie's little song, Jimmy's little play, it's now 1991. The end of 1990, Soldier of Love was a big hit. Sacred Emotion was a big hit for me. And I wanted to do something to redeem myself from the big failure that I had on Broadway, where I opened and closed the same night. And yeah, oh. It was a show called Little Johnny Jones, and I promised myself that I would someday redeem myself with a musical to erase that mistake, even though I talk about it every night here in this theater. <laughs> so, I'm, in, I'm living in St. George, Utah at the time with my wife and kids. Yeah, baby. And my manager at the time calls me and said, uh, they want you out to audition for a play called Joseph and the Amazing Technical Dream Code. Now, think about this. All I know about the musical is Marie's song and Jimmy's cute little play. Now, let me back up a little bit. I'm not an actor. I'm a singer. I don't really want to be an actor. I have no desire to be in movies. I like what I do on stage. I like to sing, right? But for some reason, you guys, I had this desire in me to check, my, check myself into a place called the Beverly Hills Playhouse to learn how to act. And I'm thinking, why? Am I doing this? This is prior to getting the offer. So the offer comes in, and the only way I can do these auditions in New York City, because I'm so busy in Los Angeles with the acting classes that I really didn't want to do, and I'm you know, trying to figure out the next album and whatnot. The only way I could do it was to take a red eye to Los to, from Los Angeles to New York do the audition, and fly back. And I thought, I'm not, I'm not gonna get the gig, but it's good experience. On the way to the airport, I stop at Tower Records on Sunset Boulevard, and I pick up this... <laughs> Did you work there or something? <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's even there anymore, right? Yeah, me too. So, I mean, yeah, exactly. But I got a CD of the soundtrack because they said, we want you to sing Any Dream Will Do and Close Every Door. So I said, okay, I'll get the CD. I'll learn it on the way to, to uh, New York. I'll do the audition, come on back. Go to the airport, get on the plane, put my headphones on, we take off, I hit play, and I fall asleep. <laughs> the next thing I know, we're landing. I am so freaked out. I have to get to this audition. I'm running late, so I tell the driver to step on as fast as you can. And I don't know what I'm gonna do. So I get to the theater, and there's a lot of people lined up to, to audition for this part. And I'm, I'm panicking. I'm saying, okay, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Donnie Osmond, you're next. I walk out on stage, and it's just like the movies, you guys. There's what's called a ghost lamp on stage with one light. There's a, an upright piano with a pl piano player on it, an empty stage, and you can't see anybody in the audience. There's nobody in the audience except maybe just, I see about four or five people out there who can't see their faces. But those are the producers. And I walk out in front of the stage. I said, uh, Mr. Dubitsky, I'm not prepared for this. Guys, you don't ever say that to a producer. <laughs> He said, what? 
and that's the way he talked. I, and I told him the problem. I told him the situation, what happened on the airplane. He said, well, but you've got to sing something. I said, well, I can sing you some of my songs at the piano. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, fine. So I kicked the piano player off, and I sing a couple of songs. Sacred Emotion was one of them. And I just, I finished these two songs. No applause at all. These pieces of people are just jaded. <laughs> <laughs> and I walked up in front of the stage thinking, okay, I blew this, so I need to get off the stage now. And Mr. Kabinsky says, you got to sing something from the show, kid. I said, well, Mr. Kabinsky, the only way I can do this is to read the lyrics off the CD booklet. I know the melody, but uh, that's, all, that's the way I have to do it. He said, well, I'll just get it. Yeah, go, go do it. Now I know why. I had a desire, something inside me was saying, check yourself in to learn acting. So I said, I'm going to close every door. The hardest one of the two. <laughs> Intro starts. Close every door to me. Hide all the world from me. Bar all the windows and shut out the light. Do and I went into this. Well, it's interesting. So as I was singing, I was alone. As you've seen me on stage, I kind of close my eyes sometimes when I sing. The reason I do that is I go someplace. I went someplace when I was singing Close Every Door, and I threw myself into it. You know at the very end, For we know we shall find the high note. I never heard anybody do that. It wasn't on the CD, but I went for it. And I had lots of oxygen in my head. For we know we shall find. I hung on to it for a long time. Our hope is of mine, for we have been promised. A land of our own. But that's not what happened. I finished, and you could hear a pin drop. And the next thing I heard was Dark Garth Trubinsky's voice saying, Come here, kid. <laughs> walk down, as I get closer and closer to these four or five people, their faces start to have light on, I can see who they are, and I walk up to Garth, and he says to me, I'm canceling all the other auditions, you're the Joseph I want. No, I'm not going to sing it now. Pace yourself, lady. Pace yourself. <laughs> Are you tearing up? Are you? And you too? I was too. <laughs> because it is such... Actually, there's, there's three pictures I want to show you. Can you bring up these pictures? Um, I don't think I've ever used these pictures before in um, social media or anything like that. But these, go ahead, go ahead. So. That was opening night. That's Garth Dubinsky, my producer on the left, and a little writer named Andrew Lloyd Webber. You're so young. I know. That was, uh, that was right after opening night. I got some of you have heard this probably, but that man right there, uh, well, it was <laughs> actually it was just before that picture was taken. I'm as nervous as I can be. I'm at the Elgin Theater in uh, Toronto. Woo! Woo! Yeah, baby! Yeah. That's where it all began. And um, I did something at the end of the show that you don't do. You don't do this in the, in the world of theater, musical theater. 
Angela Weber is sitting right there. At the end of the show, we're taking a bow. All the news cameras, they rush to the stage, standing ovation, and we're taking a bow, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this is unbelievable. And this is what I did. I came to the front of the stage during the applause, and I say, come here. You don't do that to Lord Lloyd Webber. <laughs> you plan these things. And he looked at me like, okay. So he comes over, and he walks up on the steps. And he walks up on stage. I'm right here. Andrew Lloyd Webber here. Janet Metz, my narr narrator right there. And the entire cast lined up. And we take a final curtain call bow. Now, this is what happened. As we're taking the bow, he turns to me as we're going and says, where have you been keeping that voice all these years? <laughs> that gave me the confidence to go on. <laughs> because think about it. Think about it. I just failed on Broadway. I don't have a recording contract. Nobody will sign me to any deal. I'm trying as hard as I can to get back in show business. Everybody's telling me I'm a has-been. And Andrew Lloyd Webber says that. That gave me the confidence to go on. That man right there. Give me the next picture. Okay. <laughs> Sir Richard Attenborough and Joan Collins. We're going to... Uh, Play a clip a little bit later with me and Joan Collins. <laughs> I'll, I won't. I won't jump the gun here and tell you the story there. But what a pleasure it was to work with both of these legends and uh, the stories that this man told when we were setting up for each shot. It, it was just. It was fantastic. Anyway, next picture, please. That was. Oh, stop with the girls. <laughs> Grow up. <laughs> I got to say something about the morning clock. No, I'll wait until later. On. But that, that was because uh, they didn't allow pictures on set. So, really, I think that's the only picture uh, during the making of the, of the video, of the film, besides the one with Richard Edinburgh and Joan Collins. But the only picture I had with Sir Lloyd, Lloyd Webber, uh, Sir Andrew Lloyd Webber, um, and I don't know why I left that. That arrow. <laughs> My bad. My bad. Oh, that's funny. Okay, that's it. Now, let's go to the next one. Um, this one, during the course of this, um, this musical that I did six, six years, I found out so much about Joseph's life. I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but his life was absolutely amazing. What a uh, textbook life to follow. But I don't know where Tim Rice, because he came up with the lyrics, I don't know where he discovered this, because I searched the scriptures over and over and over again. And I couldn't find it, but Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber discovered that uh, Jacob had a last name. Does anybody know the last name? Have you ever discovered this? In, it's not in the Bible. It's somewhere else. His last name was Anson. Jacob, Jacob. Hit the video, come on. Okay, we're gonna do this next video, but I want you to notice something. Um, it's the coats, it's the colors of the coats. Who knows the, the colors of the coats? Yeah. <laughs> you know the colors? Yeah. Are you sure you know the colors? Yeah. What? Yes. Okay. I'm gonna test you. Okay? It was Yeah, I 
want you to know something. I want you to know something. I never memorized the colors. In all six years, okay, and this is, you're gonna see in this video, although the audio is different because we pre-recorded the audio, but uh, I would say it was red and yellow and green and brown and scarlet and black and ochre and peach and ruby and olive and violet and lilac and gold and chocolate and gold. Oh, no, excuse me, hold on. Let me back up. This is what I didn't remember. It was red and yellow and green and brown and scarlet and black and ochre and peach and ruby and olive and lilac and gold and chocolate. No. See, I can run. I'll point it out when I see the video. Because here's what happened, you guys. During the choreography, um, it was red, and, and I was showing all the kids, red and green and brown and scarlet and black and ochre and peach. That's where I stopped. That's what it was, a peach. You're going to hear me still singing, but in the live version, I had to stop singing because it was all about showing the kids the colors of the coats. And cream and crimson and silver and rose and azure and rust. And then I started russet and lemon and uh, whatever it is. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> when people would challenge me to the colors, I always got it wrong. You'd think if anybody would know it'd be me, but I was never required to memorize the colors because there was that section that I had to show the kids. So you can see, you can see how I couldn't, you know, I wouldn't have known those words because I was required to say them. <laughs> how many colors are there? <laughs> yeah, 29, 29. <laughs> See, those are things you'd know. I wouldn't know. I studied his life. I didn't study the amount of colors, okay? Okay, so. You had the script? You had the script? My original script? Oh, that's okay. Actually, I had the original script. I've got so many. In fact, later on, you know the, uh, what's it called, the chalet? The chalet? Chalice. Chalice. The cup. I have the actual cup. That if you're careful, please be careful with it. I'm going to let you pass it around. Take pictures with it. But please promise me to be careful with it. Because it's the, it's the very one I used for six years. And the one that's in the movie. Okay. <laughs> okay, now we're going to go to the snake pit. I'm going to tell you a story I have never told before. So, in the live version, the pit was a little bit smaller than what we did in, in, the, in the video, in, in the movie. And when they threw me in, I had to be really careful that I didn't hit my head on the other side of the pit. Now, they just throw me down to the floor. There's no pit, right? So I fall down, and I'm in this pit, and I go like this, and I'm putting the snake on my hand, right? So the narrator, <laughs> she would come over and look in the pit like, oh, you poor guy. Almost every night, I would either put buck teeth in, <laughs> I'd pull faces, I'd wear a mask, I'd do all kinds of things because I tried to crack up the narrator. Because she had to look really, really serious and go, oh, you poor guy! <laughs> so, this is the, the snake pit scene. The camel, the camel, one time in Chicago, one of the, uh, yeah, baby. One time, um, one of the stagehands, to be honest with you, you know, you're doing this eight times a week, and it kind of gets a little monotonous, so you try to find things that kind of change it up a little bit, like wearing masks, buck teeth, all that kind of stuff, you know? So, before the show started, one of the stagehands put a cigarette in the camera's mouth. <laughs> So it was a camel with a camel. <laughs> and so I'm on 
on stage, and I can't remember what scene it was when the, when the camel goes across the stage, and I see that I almost died. <laughs> but I can't come out of character, right? So, okay, this next video, you guys. This is Potiphar. Would you like to hear some stories about this? <laughs> there is a <laughs> there is a scene where there's a close-up of my buttocks, <laughs> where she's grabbing my butt. <laughs> and I don't know, I don't know what got into her, but she kept having to rehearse that scene. <laughs> what? What do I? But you know what's interesting? What? Oh, stop it! I want. I, I shouldn't tell you this. I should take this, but the loincloth has got padding back there. So it makes my butt look bigger. <laughs> because, uh, why am I disclosing this? <laughs> because, you know, I'm not, I'm not a really big guy, so I have a, a skinny little butt. And so they put this padding in, in the back we were just of my, uh, my uh, loincloth. So anyway, as you'll see, when she starts ripping my clothes off, they... <laughs> The director said, we need a close-up of your butt. <laughs> so I'm like this, and they had a camera right there. It's okay, go. And she grabs my butt. It's okay, we got it. Nope, we gotta do it again. <laughs> so you'll see the close-up. But at the end of this clip is when I am um, accused of doing something horrible with Mrs. Potiphar. Mr. P Mr. Potiphar walks in, you know this, the whole scene, you know what happens, and they accuse me, and they throw me into a pit. So, the effects of this falling into the pit is really cool, but I was held up by wires, you can't see them, and, but they were, I was actually falling, there was a fan uh, blowing my hair back, but then at the very, very end of, this, of that scene of me falling, it was a stuntman that did the actual fall from a very high, high place. You see him falling, there's a cutaway, and then it cuts back to me falling onto the floor. Well, <laughs> I wanted to make it look really authentic. <laughs> Stupid me, right? Method acting. I could have just gone up a little bit, boom, and fallen on the floor. But I jumped up. And what you're going to see is a real fall onto the floor. And I really hurt myself <laughs> real badly. But check out the butt scene. <laughs> oh, one, one, one second, one second. Okay, we'll, we'll start over. One, one other thing I gotta say at the beginning of this thing. I'm not mic'd. There's no mic. All of these, like, excuse me, all that, all that stuff was put in later. So I had to watch the film and, and dub exactly what I said. And back in those days, nowadays it's, it's very easy to do because we have the technology to do that. But back in those days, you'd have to rehearse it, rehearse it, rehearse it, keep trying it. So all of these sounds that I'm making is after it was filmed. Yeah. Yeah. Now, close every door. In my opinion, is the most important part of this story. And I think, because um, people have told me that it's, I'm really believable in this, this scene, do you know why? Yes. I had the flu. I was so sick. Um, I could barely even walk out to the stage. And I don't want to get graphic with it, but I was very, very sick. And to the point where I thought we were going to have to cancel the day of shooting. And somehow I just found energy. I don't know where I found it. And the director said, can you do this? I said, well, we try. We just try. We only did this maybe one or two, maybe two takes of this. And this is what we came up with. Now, let me just explain to you why this scene is so important to me. To the whole story of Joseph. We all know what happened to him. He sold into Egypt. His brothers did that to him. We know the outcome of what happened. But in every story, 
every great story, um, it's what we call an arc. There's a beginning, a middle, or the apex, and an end. And everything in between of those two, those three points, fill in exactly what happens in the beginning, the middle, and the end. Close every door is the apex of Joseph's life. Except it's an inverse arc. He started out great. He ended great. But he went to the depths of hell. That's what's so important about this, this moment. Because you actually see, at least in my mind, we can see Joseph going from a, a young man to a leader. A lot of that takes place in the next scene when he starts interpreting dreams. But to me, this scene shows this young man becoming a leader. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take a little break right now. Because I want to hear from you. Questions, comments, Anything you want to say? Yes. I've got some articles from. You got some articles from your Elvin performances. I've got a newspaper article with Dead from Dead from which performance? When you were in Toronto at the Elgin Theater. I've oh, you got articles from yeah. the time. I've got a newspaper here with Debbie's picture on the front. They're yours. I brought them. I can have them. Yeah. Yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, can you help me with that, Kristen? Thank you so much. Yes, right there. It was filmed in Pinewood Studios. This is good. Good question because that scene right there uh, is actually the same stage, uh, almost the exact same place we did that uh, scene with um, Joan Collins. Exact same place, except they start the, the, uh, the set. That is where they did all the James Bond films. Yeah, it was so because I'm such a James Bond fan. So I thought it was so cool. I'm I'm Joseph. No, I'm James Bond right now. <laughs> Dun, 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 in my boy club. Yes. <laughs> What's that? Will I bring Joseph from Edinburgh to the U.S.? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's assuming I'm controlling it. You, you'd have to ask Andrew Lloyd Webber about that one. But I'm going to I'm going to make a prediction that um, we're bound to. You know, it, just seemed, it seems like, yeah, baby, it seems like it's in the cards that, that they, he would want to do that, but uh, I have no idea. I can't even say yes or no to that one, but it seems like, it seems probable. Let's put it that way. Yes. What kind of workout program did I have? Well, these are good questions. I was in the gym eight days a week. I, I worked my butt off, literally. That's why they had to put padding back. No, I was, uh, I was in such good shape. In fact, uh, before every single show, uh, there was a part of the set where I could grab onto it, I had to jump and grab up, and I would do um, pull-ups. I got up to about 50, 50 pull-ups uh, before every show, and then every show I would do 100 push-ups before every show. And then the set-ups went through forever. But, uh, but I would, what's that? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you saying that. Because when you're half naked on stage, that's motivation. You know? It really is. In fact, I remember the first time uh, I, uh, I went to get my wardrobe fittings. And they bring in the coat, and oh, this is so cool. By the way, back then it was $5,000. Can you imagine? It was all handmade. Imagine the cost today. But anyway, I'm trying all the outfits on, the armor and all that, and this is awesome. And then they bring in this little piece of material. <laughs> and I said, what's that? He said, this is what you're going to do 90% of the show with. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, what have I got myself into? But uh, yeah, that was kind of scary. So a uh, very difficult regimen, yes. Most definitely. Most definitely. 
Um, in fact, our lives kind of parallel a lot. My brothers didn't sell me into Los Angeles. They would have. But there, there are a lot of parallels um, with the life of Joseph at the same age. He was, you know, I think it was in his young early twenties when he was sold, uh, and. My 20s, were, I don't ever want to relive my 20s again. It was the worst time of my life. And I started this when I was 32, and that's about the time he became in charge of Egypt. And I don't want to go into too much of that because that puts me on such a pedestal, I don't want to do that. But it was really interesting as I was studying his life, I could really relate to that life of Joseph and the hardships that he went through. So maybe it was all on purpose, that I, or reason that I went through all this. Yes. Oh, the Donnie doll. Yes. What's that? You took pictures of him all around Las Vegas yesterday. <laughs> you are a sick one. <laughs> what? He had a lot of fun? Yeah. You really are sick. <laughs> okay, I want you to do me a favor. Look at the head of, Do of the Donnie doll. Look at the neck. It doesn't fit, does it? No. It's a canned body. <laughs> This is true, you guys. Mattel made a whole body in Gollum with Marie, and they made a Donnie head. <laughs> What's that? What I want? Say it again. Be in Chicago. Oh, what did I like about being in Chicago? Everything. I love when they, they colored the lake on St. Patrick's Day. I, I love performing at the Chicago Theater. We're going back there this summer. In fact, in the basement, there's a whole mural on a whole wall. Back, it's, it's entertainment history backstage at the Chicago Theater. Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., they signed the backstage door. It's, it's a relic. And everywhere you go in this theater, it is priceless with names like you can't believe. And they dedicated an entire wall to Joseph. Because during those 17 months that we were there, people would come in and out of the cast, but every single person signed that wall. And I'm gonna go back there and re-sign it. Yes. This is the show, um, Joseph at the Christian School we work, and you were known by a really fun nickname. Oh, I can hardly wait. <laughs> They called you the hot grampy. <laughs> I like that, baby. The hot grampy. I'm going to change the billboard out there. You come to the hot grampy show, baby. Over here on the side. Yes. What is your name, by the way? Octavia. Octavia, that's right. How old are you? Ten years old. Ten years. Okay, what do you have? What question do you have? It took us three weeks, I think it was, to make the movie. It was about three weeks because we all knew our part. <laughs> and uh, we had to restage a few things from the live show. But uh, yeah, it was about three, four weeks, something like that. And what's your favorite song from the movie? I would have to say Close Every Door is my favorite. My favorite scene, uh, I like the snake. The snake scene. Um, but my all-time favorite scene is coming up, where Joseph gets really mad. Yeah. He turns the cup over. That's my favorite part of the movie, and that's coming up. Yes. I think you look very amazing in that. Oh, thank you. Loin pot, and you still look great. Oh, thank you, thank you. But you'll never see me in that loin cloth again, baby. All right, let's get back to some clips. Yeah. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> That's it? Thank you for what? Thank you for, say, for saying that because, I, I really mean it, thank you for saying that because, um, yeah, it took a lot of work. A lot of work. You know, just the preparation. That's why I told you in the beginning all the things that I went through and the, the working out eight days a week and all of that stuff, it took a lot of work. What's that? What did Debbie think? 
All the things you're going through right now. <laughs> I'm not even gonna say it. Yeah, no, 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 it's okay. She saw the one cloth every night, okay? <laughs> Okay. Oh, it did, it, it did fall off. Yeah, because it, I tell this story sometimes here in this, this, this theater. There were four snaps that kept it on. That's it. Four snaps. And during the scene where Mrs. Potiphar chases me around the bed, it was the wife scene, not the film. She tried to pull the loin cloth off. It was a game we played every night. And uh, sometimes, yeah, some game, right? <laughs> At my expense. But sometimes by the time I grabbed it, it was just down to one snap before it came off. And it never came off except one show. In Salt Lake City, exactly. <laughs> Boy, did that show come to a screeching halt. <laughs> I had something on underneath it, okay? It's okay, baby, it's all right. Yes. Good question. Is it the same cast on the movie that I, that was on the live stage? No. No. Um, this is a great cast. Really good cast. But the cast that I that I played six years with, of course, a lot of them changed over the course of the six years. It was an amazing cast. Plus, there's some things that you can do live that you can't capture in film. For instance, flying over the audience. You know, I would fly over the audience every night, and the cape, or the cape, the coat, uh, they, they would don the coat on me uh, about right here, and uh, I was connected to a wire, and I was, give me my coat, and, coat, and I started flying, and the coat would just extend out in front of the stage until it reached the entire width of the stage. So the whole audience was covered with this rainbow uh, coat. And I'm, I'm clear out there in the middle of the audience. I've got to tell you this story. Some of you know this story. Um, Chicago. A good friend of mine gave me a chocolate eclair before, yeah, I hear the whispers and you some people that gave me a chocolate eclair just before the show. I had warmed my voice up. Guys, you don't eat a chocolate eclair when you're just about to do a two and a half hour show of singing, right? Especially an Android rapper show, it's hard. So I was a good boy, put it on my makeup table, and left it there, and I did the show. I came back during intermission, hold oh, this thing was really good. But I was a good boy, I didn't touch it, so I go do the second act, I come back up, I have eight minutes exactly to put the harness on, to put the shirt on, and then to run downstairs, and they hooked me up, put the coat on. No, no, excuse me, I had the coat on, and then they hooked, hooked me up to the uh, to the wire. I got eight minutes. I can eat this chocolate. Because <laughs> all I had to say is, give me my color coat, my amazing colored coat. That's all I got to say. <laughs> so grab this eclair. And I am enjoying it like crazy. My dressing room is on the second floor. And I'm eating it and I realize, my cue! I'm running late. I'm running down the stairs, trying to eat this thing as fast as I can. <laughs> and I'm right, okay, I'm over here. I have to enter upstage left, these doors that open up. And I'm right behind the door eating this as fast as I can. I don't want to throw it away because I'm really good. So I'm eating it as fast as I can. And I'm thinking, I gotta get this down. I'm chewing, I'm chewing, I'm chewing. It's not going down. The door opens up. I gotta run out. So I'm running out, and trying to chew inconspicuously as I take my bow. It's not going down. I got so much in my mouth. They hooked me on the wire. I start flying. And here comes my vocal cue. No. Give me an I'm spraying chocolate eclair. <laughs> Let's go to another clip. How much time do we have? Mm -hmm.
Okay, I've got to skip ahead because uh, I'm going to go to, uh, you know, the Go 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 Joe's and the dreams. Let's go to that. All right, we'll do it. By the way, you know, in the live version, you know who played the guru? Jacob. And the guy who played that, that was Stephen Pimla, my director. It's kind of cool. Okay, we got to keep moving on here. Um, okay, the next one is um, Pharaoh's Dreams Interpreted or Explained. Now, I've got to tell you a little story. Again, this was Chicago. No, was it Chicago? No, no, this was. Uh, this could have been Boston. I think it was Boston. I, I can't remember now. But uh, what happened was seven years of bumper crops are on their way. Right? So one night, I wasn't thinking. I was, my mind was someplace else. So I said, seven years of bumper crops are on their way. <laughs> lots of wheat and tons of wheat and lots of hay. <laughs> the cast looked at me like, what? <laughs> and one other time, this was in Minneapolis. I'm, I'm uh, seeing close every door. I'm behind the bars. Close every door to me, I don't know where You know the part where the, the children's choir go, la, 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 and they take over and they sing? Well, Joseph is behind the bars and he's really pensive, thinking all of the terrible things he's going through his life. That's what he should be thinking, right? Well, my wife and I were building a home at the time. And so I'm sitting here thinking, uh, um, let's see, what were the lyrics? You know, told them, Close every door to me, I don't know. <laughs> okay, uh, just give me a number. It's after, after the kids would sing. Just give me a number. And during this, Joseph's just like, oh, what am I doing? This is, what I was thinking about is, I'm going to put the window over there. <laughs> My desk will go there. Put the door right there. I had no idea what I was doing, right? But I was, my mind was back home in Utah designing my home. And they finish, and I'm supposed to sing, just give me a number. And here comes my, my cue. You guys, I can't even remember what city I'm in, <laughs> let alone the lyrics that I'm about to sing. And I think, I gotta sing something. Beyond the horizon, <laughs> there's all kinds of stuff. Like, what? <laughs> and I knew the audience, most of them knew the words of this show, right? They're thinking, man, this guy's in trouble up there. <laughs> Finally, as one of the kids started singing what I was supposed to sing, and I caught on and got into it. But man, you talk about a panic. I just made up words, just made whatever came to my mind. It was all kinds of stuff, you know? Okay. Uh, Pharaoh's dreams and turn go. No. Now comes my favorite part of the show. Mine too. This is when he becomes uh, in charge of Egypt. And hold on one second. There's the actual. That's the actual. Wait, hold on a second. <laughs> Secret notes. Now, please be careful with it, okay? Please. Just start right here. Just start right here, and then just start passing it around. And here is the favorite scene. Go for it. Yeah, baby. I hate to say this, but we're getting close to the end. Time has really flown by. 
You want to go back to the beginning? Yeah. Yeah. To the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Any dream will do. I close my eyes. Drew back the curtain to see for certain what I thought I knew. Far, far away, someone was weeping, but the world was sleeping. Any dream will do. I wore my coat with golden lining, bright color shining, wonderful and new. And in the east, the dawn was breaking. Still has it though. But the world was waking. Any dream will do. I'm not done. A crash of drums, a flash of light, my golden coat flew out of sight. The colors faded into darkness. I was left alone. She was wearing a camel. <laughs> Helen Meister? Can I see Helen Meister? Helen, stand up. You deserve a round of applause. What? Sorry? It's just a movie, lady. <laughs> As a matter of fact, can you work your way over here? I have a little trophy I'd like to give you. It says, congratulations, winner of best costume, Donnie's Joseph Sing-Along 2024. <laughs> I mean, for somebody to have an idea to wear a camel, they deserve this, don't they? What's that? You blew your one on the camel. Oh, you got some better for Saturday? They really went all out. They really went. 
Okay, she's not wearing a she's not wearing a camel, but she's wearing a baby. She is seven months pregnant, and she is so sweet. And uh, you probably know her on social media, Trisha. Where are you, Trisha? Okay. And Moses, Moses, come on up here too. If I go around, I want, I want you to walk up on stage so they run and see this. <laughs> Be careful, don't trip. Because she has a story she has to tell you about her pregnancy that you've got to oh. hear. <laughs> so, um, I've been a Johnny Asman fan since I was literally 12. We met when we were 12 years old at the New York, not 12 years old. And we were 40, I think, or something like that. She's like, just as good. Um, and then we got... I got so lucky, I got to interview for my podcast in September, which was like wild and crazy. It was like the biggest, <laughs> the biggest dream ever. And when we were there, we were talking, because we were so nice, we talked for like literally a couple hours before your show. And um, I was like, oh, we're trying to have another baby, but it's really hard. So Ani goes, I think you're going to have another one really soon. Two weeks later, we found out we were pregnant. <laughs> and I think it happened in Vegas, so, <laughs> you know. Maybe the building will be Donnie or something like that. The first name is Elvis, so maybe we'll do like Elvis Donnie. You're gonna name it Elvis? Yeah, it's a girl. Seriously? Yeah, she's Elvis. Well, then I'll take credit for it. Yeah. No, I didn't say no. That didn't say no. No, 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 I didn't say no. Well, I'm gonna name it Elvis. Okay. Yeah, that's what But by the way, she first told me, you said it a little differently. She's, because uh, when we were during the interview, she says, uh, We've been trying to get pregnant, I can't get pregnant. And I looked at her and said, it's going to happen. You did say that, yes. You I said, said it, those exact words, it's going to happen. Yeah. And the next thing I found out, she's pregnant. <laughs> so. We tried so hard, everything. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, you got the trophy. Give a hand. So, uh, we're almost out of time, but before I, before I play this last clip, um, first of all, thank you very much for being here. I hope you guys have fun. Because it's, it's, it's so much fun for me, not just to have you here and to talk about it, but to see how passionate you are about uh, this, this film, because I'm passionate about it. So passionate that this next scene, during, during those 2,000 shows that I did, I would just throw myself into the role. Yeah, thank you. And when Jacob gave this tattered and torn coat back to Joseph, I would sometimes on, on stage start crying. And the guy who played Jacob, he started crying. It was that real on stage, you guys. I know that may sound silly to some of you, but when you're acting, and I'm so glad I went to the Beverly Hills Playhouse to learn how, you know, the little bit of acting that I know. When you, when you throw yourself into a role, I guess I know about acting because when I sing, I throw myself into the lyrics of the song. In fact, do I have time? Yes, I have time. I'm going to tell you the story. <laughs> Preparing for the role. I've never really done musical theater like I should have done. Even though I did Little Johnny Jones, I said, I want to be able to sing this because it's Andrew Lloyd Webber music. So I went to Los Angeles and I found a vocal coach. This is, this is the work, as I mentioned here. This is the work that I went through. And I went to him, his name was Lee Sweetland. An elderly gentleman, I rang the doorbell, he comes to his house, his, his wife came, invited me in. There's a piano there, I sit down, he says, okay, let's start. He gives me a piece of paper, and on this paper is a poem. He said, okay, Donnie, read that poem to me. I said, okay. So I read the poem, and he said, that was terrible. 
says, I'm sorry. He said, no, read the poem to me. He said, okay. So I read the poem. He said, okay, well, that's a little bit better. Now, read the poem. Live the words. I threw myself in. And that story, whatever the poem was, I wish I knew what it was, came to life. I got chills when I read this poem. He finished it. He looked at me, he said, thank you, we're done. <laughs> I said, what? He said, no, we're done. I said, we didn't sing anything. He said, we didn't need to. Singing in musical theater is speaking. You just put notes to it. When you approach it in that way, the story becomes the most important thing. The words, the lyrics, the meaning behind what Tim Rice and Andrew Lloyd Webber wrote. These guys were 19 years old when they wrote this and debuted in Scotland, where I'm gonna be in December. It came out in 1979. And I learned so much from Lee Sweet that I have used it ever since 1992 when I started doing Chosen. And the lyrics are so important. All right, any of you coming to the show tonight or tomorrow? <laughs> so, when I'm singing a song, yeah, when I'm dancing and all this stuff, it's like whatever, the dancing and all that stuff. But when I'm singing a ballad, close every door to me. When I first started singing Close Every Door, I sang it like this. Close every door to me. Hide all the world from me. Bar all the windows and shut out the light. It has nothing to do with the words. Do what you want to me. Hate me and laugh at me. Darken my daytime. Torture my nights. It's all about the music. Where are the words? And that's what he's talking about. Close every door to me. Hide all the world from me. See the difference? Huge difference. So there'll be some songs tonight that you'll hear me sing. Close the door, be one. Breeze on by. Baby, you're driving me crazy. Don't want anybody thinking about you. In the way that I'm thinking about you. Oh, baby. When I wrote those words, I lived the experience. I wrote the experience in my mind, what I felt. And that's what I try to do with lyrics. That's what I try to do with Joseph. And this last scene, you're going to see a lot of emotion. And. It was the last scene of the movie. And I realized, you can only imagine what I was going through during this scene, because I realized it was the end. I knew I would never play Joseph again. Possibly, you know, Potiphar, or Potiphar, uh, Pharaoh. But there were no plans. I knew this was the end. So when, when you see me singing this at the end, you can only imagine what's going through my mind. Check it out. Well, you guys, this brings it to an end. But we have a lot of stuff for the rest of the week that we're going to have fun with. But this meant a lot to me. I hope it meant a lot to you. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Um, unfortunately, we've got to vacate the room quickly because we've got a show tonight. But thank you so much for being here. And uh, please be careful wherever you're going, whether you're going home or whatever you might be doing. And somebody else see you tonight. See you tonight. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.